Thank you, thank you. It's good to reconnect with you um, after, after so, so many years. This is really my summer report. This is what I did uh, during the summer, looking at what's happening on the continent in terms of uh, uh, just expanding connectivity, which is uh, essential for the ability of the continent to connect to the rest of the world, but also to tap into this large quantities of scientific and technical information that is available uh, so that Africans don't have to reinvent everything. Uh, it's just the, one of those advantages of late commerce is that you can harvest what has been generated by your predecessors. So that's one of the reasons I got interested in, a, in a looking at looking at broadband. But uh, before we get started, let's just get a kind of a good picture of people talk about Africa and then say, look, I've just been to Africa. Oh, and I was really building this wonderful school uh, somewhere or I constructed a well. This is what, <laughs> this is what you did. This is, a, this is a comment around my students who are in the audience. Uh, but this is, Africa is a fairly large place and people, <laughs> people don't appreciate how big the place is, and many of my colleagues think that since there are 53 countries, it must be the size of the United States because the U.S. has 50 states. Uh, but let me just give you a sense of the scale of the continent. You can fit the U.S., uh, India, uh, China, uh, all of Western Europe, <laughs> India, Argentina, and have sufficient room to sneak in the United Kingdom. So it's, uh, it's actually fairly large place and uh, this underlies some of the challenges associated with getting to do anything on the continent just the sheer scale or the size of the place uh, and this is one of the reasons i i think the broadband uh, internet especially the optical fiber connections are really interesting is that you can't do it on a small scale you can't say let's just connect between south africa and mozambique and if it works then we'll extend it you actually have to do the whole thing uh, connected to the rest of the world. You can't do it just doing small pilots here and there. Don't really work uh, uh, given, given the size of the, of the, of the continent. And uh, uh, obviously there have been other attempts to address infrastructure uh, problems with very fairly limited railway network, uh, very limited power transmission cables. And even the primary roads are fairly limited. Anybody who has tried traveling around the continent will, will have experienced a lot of difficulties uh, getting around. And the internet has been probably the most interesting part, especially uh, uh, I think the most dramatic advancement has been in the area of mobile phones, and partly because they are their own infrastructure, essentially. Uh, and having it's been the fastest growing region in terms of connectivity in the world is, is Africa. But uh, a lot of it has been uh, fairly limited by a kind of a low capacity. I think the best, probably the, mes the best expression of this is uh, an attempt by a South African company to show that, in fact, uh, it's really difficult to transmit uh, large, let me see if I can get this. Uh, can you set this up? This is a. This is called the Winston Index. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Winston Index. This is a South African company that decided that, uh, given the low speeds provided by existing companies, they will try to see if you could use a pigeon to transmit uh, memory sticks uh, across companies. This is a, f a fifty a fifty mile. A 50 mile uh, distance and so uh, let me I, I really would like to show this this is uh, actually quite uh, uh, quite interesting uh, with a, this is a competition between a pigeon and the, the telecom company in South Africa uh, they basically this is one of those advantages of advances in, in new technology you wouldn't have done this uh, a few years ago it's only possible because of advances in, uh, in the connectivity uh, Yay, they, there I go. Yeah, this was uh, this was done on the tenth of this month, and uh, the pigeon actually won. Was able to deliver the fiber, I mean the uh, the memory stick. They downloaded the 
the data in, uh, it took about two hours. Uh, by that time, the South African telecom company had succeeded in delivering only 4% of, uh, of, the, of the data. So uh, I think there is a real market for pigeons now in, <laughs> uh, in Africa at the moment. But this is, to me, really summarizes the, the challenges that the continent actually uh, I've, I've always wanted to have a, a very clear index of how you measure <laughs> transmission of data, and certainly Winston, this is the name of the of the pigeon, is really the best uh, the best way to do it. Uh, there's it has its own uh, followers, about seven thousand followers on Facebook at the moment. It has its own Facebook page. Uh, how do I get uh, how do I get out of this so that I can go beyond the uh, yeah, yeah, yes, that would be that would be that would be that would be very helpful. So, so uh, I was in a, in, in Tanzania the launching of the SICOM fiber optic cable, which is really the first time uh, we've had that connectivity on the eastern coast of Africa, which has been essentially uh, cut off. I was there as a as a guest of the president, and uh, the president did a great job in uh, explaining to me how the system actually functions. Um, he, um, we are hoping that one day we could have him to come and sp come and speak here. But he was extremely excited about the potential contributions of of this infrastructure to the uh, to the continent. I think the w one idea that I kind of I was left with listening to him was he had this vision that for the first time now you can have one teacher uh, teach thousands and thousands of Tanzanian kids. Uh, in the sciences without having to train uh, a lot of new scientists. And he was basically looking at the possibility of being able to connect into uh, courses that are offered in various universities uh, around, around the world. He had other examples of what he thought would be some of the most significant contributions of this facility to, to his country. Uh, I took the trouble of going down at the manhole so that I could actually see this this cable is a very, very kind of modest looking <laughs> uh, uh, facility. Uh, I also just wanted to report here that uh, as of this weekend, the, the cable from London to Lagos just landed. Uh, so the West Africa is also being supplemented by an additional cable. So we have uh, the original uh, SAT-3 uh, which is, has very low capacity utilization, probably roughly 5% capacity utilization. Uh, we have the one I really want to talk about is the SICOM that starts in South Africa and goes all the way to London. Uh, and uh, they have great names. The, my favorite ones are the main one. This is a, there can't be any other one other than the main one. And then there's a tiny one connecting Madagascar with Mauritius. It's called Lion. <laughs> This is a, a, a this is a this is a dramatic change. All these proposals are serious proposals that are going to be basically implemented, and for a lot of them, the construction has actually started. And so we are looking to a continent that's going to look radically different uh, over a very short period. Uh, this is a, and I think the only analogy I can draw from this is the the impact of mobile phones, which. Uh, not long ago, they were basically a dream uh, for, for most Africans. Uh, we call them mobile phones because, not because we carry them in our pockets, but because the first mobile phone developed by Ericsson in 1956 uh, was called such, was called mobile phone telephone A. It weighed about 42 kilos. Uh, but it was the first time you had a technology you could move from one place to another and be able to communicate without being physically uh, physically connected. Uh, it was inconceivable then that you could ever have this kind of device used outside the military or the police force. You needed a car to carry it around. Uh, I don't know if anybody here is old enough to have owned a car phone. Uh, this is a, you actually owned a car phone. Uh, subsequently, uh, Martin Cooper at Motorola spent 10 years basically miniaturizing the car phone. He had this vision that this is a technology that should be available to, uh, to everybody else. And uh, when the mo these mobile phones arrived in Africa, we quickly found 
new not only new markets but also derivative products. That guy was selling rubber bands. That was his market. That obviously, the Africans wanted to be very closely connected to their friends and relatives. Uh, I, also, I, I think this is probably the first, uh, uh, the, the first uh, Bluetooth. <laughs> I, ca I can't think of, uh, I always think of Bluetooth having been invented somewhere in Africa. Yeah, it, it's not clear whether this was in a, there's some dispute where this picture was taken. It was uh, either Ethiopia or, uh, or the Gambia, one of, one of those. And now we have a, a very dramatic development, which is the ability tra to transmit money using mobile phones, the so-called M-Pesa, uh, the mobile money system used in Kenya. That it's, it's now being used in about 20, 25 countries, a typically Kenyan, uh, Kenyan invention. This would not, we, nobody could have anticipated that such an industry uh, would, develop, uh, would develop so quickly. It's now quite ambiguous. We don't know whether the cell phone companies will take over banks or banks will start taking over cell phone companies. But a new standard in transmitting money has been established by, just by the, the, the mere availability of mobile phones. Uh, the limiting factor for getting anything significant done has been basically the absence of, of broadband internet, limited by uh, basically the lack of, uh, of uh, fiber optical cables. The, the eastern coast of Africa has probably been the longest coastline uh, anywhere in, uh, in the tropics without, uh, without connection. And the reason it's possible to do that now is just a dramatic decline in the price of laying fiber optic cables. Uh, it's basically uh, an order of magnitude decline over the last 10 years. Uh, so practically, anybody can now do it. It's just really, uh, really cheap. But the driving force is for, especially for connecting the eastern coast of Africa, has been the timetable for the World Cup. Uh, because the Europeans uh, would basically would not allow the World Cup to take place in South Africa if they can't watch it. Uh, and so this, is, this has been the, the, the critical deadline has been driven by soccer. I would never have thought uh, at all that, uh, that sport would have such a significant impact on the transformation of African economies, especially uh, in, the domain of, in the domain of infrastructure. Certainly mu much more significant than what the development agencies have done in that region uh, in the last two, two decades or so. Uh, and following that is this proposal by Google and its partners, the other three billion, uh, which is to launch 16 satellites in space uh, of with providing sufficient in-orbit in redundancy so that any place in the tropics uh, would, be able to, would be able to have access. Uh, unlike fiber optic cables, you don't have to do any wiring, you just need to give coordinates. And they'll be able to teledirect one of the antennas on each of the satellites to your specific locations. It's going to be, sadly, I think it's, it's actually not, uh, not, 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 not working. And the, the launching will be, will be done, they will start launching this at the end of next year. So uh, we envisage basically a continent that will be very dramatically transformed over a very short period. And the questions, the, the key public policy questions really relate to one, what it means for uh, at least three critical areas. One is the area of access devices, whether the continent has sufficient policies to enable everybody who can subscribe to these services to actually have access to the services, which is basically the area of the area of devices, computers, uh, and other utilities. The second has to do with the content, how the continent is managing the area of not only being able to access continent, content generated by others, but also being able to generate its own continent, content and make it available to the global market. And the third area I wanted to talk about a bit has to do with the, the ability of the continent to contribute through the, de the development of applications as we, as the the continent basically joins the rest of the, the rest of the global community. <coughs> and these are issues that are being debated quite uh, extensively because of, one is the pace at which the connectivity has been done hasn't given most governments sufficient time to adjust their policies and laws to reflect the capabilities that already, that are being installed at the moment. So the institutions, laws and policies are lagging way behind 
the capabilities that exist. And this might become essentially the, the critical limiting factor to the ability of the continent to tap into, into the vast quantities of knowledge available worldwide. Uh, initially, much of the interest has been around basically call centers, uh, basically the ability to uh, provide call centers which everybody has gone into. Uh, but the, the companies that are laying these cables are looking at it a lot more uh, broadly. They are looking at the emergence of e-commerce, for example, uh, and looking to uh, possibilities of radically new industries being developed. I, I was able to during the summer, meet some of the young, young people working on uh, animation, for example, something they couldn't do effectively before. But now they are connected, uh, getting connected to large companies, in the, particularly in the UK and the US, and they are starting to move into animation. C production of cartoons, cartoons are very popular uh, in Africa. I think cartoons are popular everywhere. Uh, but uh, this is an area that a lot of young people are, are really interested in. And it's kind of tapping into like cultural proclivities of the continent where people are generally very expressive physically. They like to dance. Uh, and they are thinking of how you can translate that into new products and, and services. Uh, I met people who are even thinking about how you can legally capture dance so that you can protect it as a property right. Uh, so we, we're going to see so, some new innovations in intellectual property rights, in fact, arising from the from these kinds of developments. But it's also taking place at a time when uh, devices are starting to converge. You don't need to, I'm sure in your, in, your, in, your, in your basements, you may have some old devices accumulating uh, somewhere. Uh, with the advances in technology, we are starting to get to see basically mobile phones starting to function as computers and computers starting to function as mobile phones. So essentially, people are moving towards having uh, basically uh, convergent technologies. So the image of the future of Africa is, is going to be, in my view, one without desktops, uh, because everything seems to be going mobile. Uh, and uh, desktops, are, as we've known them, that you have a computer and sitting somewhere, this is really going to, going to disappear, and, and it will disappear very fast. Uh, the second area that I, I've been looking into is is uh, the growing interest among African universities, particularly to want to link up with their counterparts in the industrialized countries, tapping into services like the MIT, MIT Open Courseware. Uh, the development of, uh, of applications, there's already a couple of applications that have been developed by Kenyan, Kenyan small startup companies for Apple. So we envisage that this is going to be essentially an area that we're going to see a lot of a lot of creativity. And then because of reduction in the, in the cost of, of storage, uh, Africa has this potential to move in, right, leapfrog into the so-called cloud computing. Uh, this is a, I, I got a, a wonderful definition of cloud computing actually from the Bachman Center, which is you take everything that you've got, including your kitchen sink, and you throw it up. And if it rains, you are in luck. And if it starts to come down, you duck, and then you do it again until it actually works. Uh, so, so, and the the government officials in East Africa are exci very excited about cloud computing, partly because they see this as a potential of reducing the costs of extending extending uh, internet infrastructure uh, in in the country. And so, we're going to see. This is an example where the continent can move straight into the new new technologies. There are all sorts of debates. You, you know more about this issue in this, at this center than I do. But there are a lot of debates about privacy, about security, and all that. Uh, but the interesting thing here is just the level of interest in uh, moving to the frontiers uh, rather than following in the paths of old technological practices. Uh, the, I just mentioned already the area of mobile education, which we've seen the pioneering work of the one laptop per child at, at, a, at MIT. This is a Uruguay, where now every kid has one of these laptops. I serve on the board of directors of OLPC. And uh, we've been very interesting to see the impact, especially on getting countries 
before they adopt the laptops. Everybody is wondering why are they not adopting them. But people quickly realize the implications of these laptops for uh, educational policies, and they want to change the policies fast before they can introduce, introduce the laptops. Uh, Rwanda is one of the leading African countries. This is at the airport in Rwanda, which is one of the few places you can get free access to Wi-Fi, so kids go, go out there and, uh, and, and, and play around. And we do have a very small market in the Vatican, uh, which uh, I don't expect that it will grow very much, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, this was a, a colleague of ours from Brazil who so co committed himself to making sure that the Pope would receive uh, one of these units. Uh, and we've had the impact, one of the impacts of the laptop has been really the forcing the creation of this new market of netbooks, of which about, I would say about 14 million units were sold at the end of last year. And the estimate is, it's estimated that by the end of this year, probably 30 million units will have been, uh, would have been sold. It's growing much faster than regular, regular desktops. And the, the the, the other area which I'm, I'm looking at at the moment is the emergence of this field that I'm, I'm referring to as mo mobile health. Essentially because a lot of the information associated uh, with healthcare in the past uh, was hardly integrated, uh, stored in regular media. Uh, and now with advances in technology, a lot of this information is becoming available and it's going to change the way we do healthcare. Let me just give you a little example of this, which is a uh, uh, ultrasound, which is, this is a, an ultrasound unit. A, this is about 10 years ago. That unit cost about $20,000. And so for most developing countries, you'll find these units only in, in a few hospitals in urban areas. You would find them in most of the rural hospitals. Uh, f about five years ago, a, a company in, a, in Washington, Seattle, developed a ruggedized version initially for the U.S. military, something you could throw in your backpack uh, and get it the battlefield. I was trying to get this uh, to Kenya because I thought this was a significant improvement over the previous, the previous design. And a friend of mine called me up and said, don't do it, just wait. Next week, there will be a new device approved by FDA that is going to be much smaller. Uh, this is a, an Australian version of the same the same technology, essentially, totally miniaturized. Uh, you can plug it into, your, into the laptop. And before I could reach out to this company, two weeks later, another company in a, a university in a St. Louis, University of Washington, St. Louis, uh, announced that they had developed a version of it, uh, which basically transmits the data to, the, inform the image to a, uh, to a cell phone. So you can do this at home, essentially and uh, your doctor will look at the image, and if the doctor doesn't like the image, the doctor can ask you to actually do it. Uh, I did, by the way, give the feedback to these two guys who are obviously electrical engineers. Uh, they are not doctors, because if they were, this is not their place to look for pregnancy. <laughs> this is, uh, this is <laughs> certainly not. They have sent me another, another image, which uh, is, 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 more, is more appropriate uh, for the occasion. The, my final point regarding and the ability of the continent to take advantage of this infrastructure has to do with the way Africans are trained. One is they are hardly trained in engineering. Uh, and secondly, they are even less trained in, a, in electrical engineering, uh, electronic engineering. And if they are, it's not connected to existing practices and not the curriculum hasn't been adapted to reflect the demands of the industry at all. So what seems to be happening uh, which is a very interesting development, is that uh, telecoms ministries are now starting to create universities but putting them under the Ministry of Telecoms rather than having them operate under the Ministry of Education. Because if they are under the Ministry of Education, they'll just produce the same old, uh, use the same old curriculum which trains people to go and look for jobs and trains them using the old curriculum, uh, which is unrelated to what the industry actually needs. And uh, the first, in first country to do this was Egypt, which created the Nile University, which is embedded in the telecoms ministry, but supervised by the Ministry of Education. Uh, the Ghana created what's called the Ghana Telecoms University to do the same thing. And the critical 
issue here is that these universities have a close connection with the private sector. Therefore, the private sector can help to direct and guide the design of the curriculum through the ministry. And that information is then conveyed uh, to, the, to the universities. In the case of Ghana, the, the chairman of the university is also the minister for telecoms. So his interest is to ensure that this university can train people that the industry actually needs. And as of December last year, Kenya created the multimedia uh, university. Now, in all these cases, there have been enormous conflicts between the telecom ministries and the ministries of uh, higher education, uh, partly because the laws are very clear. They state that universities are created under the ministry of higher education, not under the ministry of telecoms. In the Kenyan case, the only way they could do it was, uh, was uh, after they were advised that they were not the first ones to do it. And secondly, that Malaysia, a country that they respect very much, had created a multimedia university which is embedded in the Ministry of Telecom. So it's a large delegation of representatives from the two ministries went to Malaysia, came back, and created, they called it exactly what the Malaysians call it. They didn't want to, to depart from the term. So this is the multimedia university of Kenya, which is modeled along the multimedia university of Malaysia. Uh, because usually nobody wants to uh, basically break with the tra with, with bre with tradition here. I understand that Tanzania is also considering creating a similar, a similar university. So this could become a trend in Africa of new, a new generation of universities created under the line ministries, the technical ministries. Uh, I have been trying to do a similar thing. This was uh, in the summer creating the Victoria Institute of Science and Technology uh, with the intent of doing exactly the same thing, but I wasn't going to wait uh, for to wait for the government. This was I was launching it with a colleague, with the chief secretary in the Ministry of Telecoms, and as you can see, the most difficult part here was really figuring out how to open the champagne bottle. <laughs> Everything else, like constructing the facilities, was a lot was a lot easier. Uh, this is where the the institute is located in a in the town of Kisumu on the, on the shores of Lake Victoria. And I went there with two volunteers, one of them from the Milton Academy here, to help start training, training people. The BBC has just been to this place to do a documentary, which they will, I think they will broadcast on the 22nd of this month. Uh, and they ask the students to actually produce something for them. So apparently the BBC will use something that has been produced by, by, by the students. Uh, it's co-located with the local university so that students can, if they are bored in class, it's, a, it's an accountancy school. If they are bored in class and they have an interesting idea, they just go across the corridor and they can talk to somebody in the institute uh, to think about how to translate some idea into a, into a business. And the students have no shortage of excuses to, to leave the classroom. So we basically try to institutionalize the basis for the excuse if you're bored with your classes. You can just go across and, uh, and, and discuss with somebody. The idea is to, for the institute to admit concepts rather than students. And then we work with the concepts to translate them into businesses. So our board of directors and associates are mostly business people. Uh, the chairman of the board of the institute is also the head of Kenya's largest commercial bank. And he has an interest because he's looking for young people he can lend money to. So we have kind of a convergent interests here. So, so I'm looking to a future, and just, just in conclusion, where, let me see if this actually works. The other one didn't. Uh, this is a, no, it won't work. I'm looking into a, a future where there's going to be a lot of debate on the continent on adjusting the laws and policies to reflect these technological opportunities. And it's really going to be pushed very much by young people who are able to do something or interested in working on new, new ideas. The infrastructure is in place, and then they find out that they just can't do it because of monopolies and other, other obstacles. I think the Winston is an attempt to use a pigeons to kind of demolish the monopolies. This is a typical monopoly thing. And as you could see from, from the pigeons, they did it completely with in-flight redundancy. It wasn't just one pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> they, had, they, had, they had several of them. They had rules, by the way, that uh, no, 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 no performance-enhancing substances in the seed, <laughs> and uh, no cats allowed anywhere, no falcons. 
uh, to go after the pigeons. They, were, they had very clear rules uh, about, about how to do it. So I think I'll stop here and uh, you can throw your kitchen sink at me if you want. <laughs> So you're encouraging us to throw the kitchen sink, and uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by throwing some cold water, yes. and I'll offer the context that obviously the subject that I'm passionate about as well, I've had the great fun of watching technological transformation on the continent over the last 15 years, um, but a couple of questions about whether the future is quite as rosy as we might hope from this. You mentioned that the SAT-3 cable, yep. this is the cable that runs down the, the west coast of Africa, it was the first major fiber optic cable uh, to connect the continent. Uh, is that about 5% usage? Is that correct? 5% usage in part because no one's been able to figure out pricing on it uh, in such a way that makes it actually useful to most West African businesses. When SAT-3 came into play, uh, my business connectivity costs in Ghana fell by about 20%, not radically. What's going to prevent this next wave of cables from being priced as exploitatively? What makes us think that we've got it right this time? Has teams really driven down the price in East Africa? Can we expect that any of these are suddenly going to make bandwidth close to as affordable in an African context as it is in a US or European context? Yeah, the SAT-3 was based on the model that you have, the assumption was that you have very few users. So you make your money by charging very highly, but providing to a very small number of users. Uh, the, all the new cables are uh, based on a different model, which is to try to extend it to a lot of users and therefore be able to drive down the price. None of that is going to happen unless you have competition, essentially. And as you can see, the, the possibility for monopoly here is going to be fairly fairly limited because you have a lot of players uh, players coming in. The South Africa, one, one company has already reduced the cost of, of broadband by 50%. Uh, and so, so I think over time we're going to see a reduction, essentially arising from the competition. I think the biggest limiting factor is going to be whether you have more users, and this is limited by access devices. The men of this country still have duty on uh, imported computers. Uh, Kenya has a duty on uh, refurbished computers. So I actually, in the, in the next few days, I'll be publishing an article on the BBC uh, website calling for removal of all duties on access devices. If you have any access device that works, there should be no duty on it. If, if say, if you can use your kitchen sink for doing it, there shouldn't be <laughs> duty on your kitchen sink. Uh, and these are the kind of leftover from old policies. The reason why Kenya has uh, apparently introduced duty on uh, refurbished computers is the claim that they are going to move into assembly of computers. I think the whole idea of assembling computers is also a misguided one uh, because the devices are converging. Uh, it doesn't make sense anymore to start assembling these devices locally. In fact, we are going to get to a point where companies providing internet services would prefer to give the devices to you for free. This is already happening in the telephone industry. I think it's going to happen in the, co in the computing arena as well. So, so I think it's a, it's a qualitatively different scenario from when SAT-3 was, was actually introduced. But unless those policies are in place, uh, unless we start to get people pressuring governments uh, to actually change the policies, uh, dealing with the monopolies, I think uh, again, Winston is, a, is an example, it's a kind of caricature of what needs to be done, which is to force governments to recognize that they will make more money if businesses expand rather than if they basically try to tax existing, existing, uh, uh, existing infrastructure. Yes. So I think you focused your presentation on the entrepreneurial uh, side of things and how universities want to be used for that. But what my question is related, how do you see Uh, things that are, are around digital inclusion, so for example, you know, that still has to be educated, but first you need to the Minister of Culture, like, use the hotspots, and now there is an increasing culture of land houses. So how do you see this affecting Africa? Because sometimes innovation comes from where you do not exp
Yeah, I think the country that has gone farthest in thinking about this has is, is been Kenya, which introduced a law uh, already, uh, it's called the Media Bill, that was adopted about a year ago. Uh, its main purpose was to anticipate these technological developments. And has this in pro it includes uh, the extension of fiber optic cables to all headquarters of political constituencies in the country, which is about 210 of them. And so that wiring the, is already being done uh, at the moment. The, the first step is actually to get the cable there. To the, they're calling it the digital villages. The idea is that every village will have a connection. This is why I'm interested in the devices, because if you have the cable getting there, but you don't have the devices, the facilities of no use or no use to you. The, the Ministry of, of uh, Telecoms announced about six months ago that it was going to import into the country about a million laptops. And then we had exactly the same old debate whether people can eat laptops. Like, should the money be used to provide people with, with, with clean water? And those, <laughs> kinds, those kinds of debates. And these this debates are not going to go away. But at least in the Kenyan case, there is a very clear uh, policy framework. They have also gone as far as saying that they will, they will uh, provide free broadband access to universities, provided the universities digitize all the content that they have, all the material they have in their collection. Uh, I don't know of any other countries that have been uh, anticipating this from a public policy perspective. Now, the way Kenya did it was to try to amend an existing law, uh, which was basically the law dealing with broadcasting. So it was got very controversial because uh, the people interested in maintaining uh, law and order tagged onto it a provision that allows the government to confiscate your equipment in case you are saying something they don't like. So this, got, this delayed the, the, actually the law got adopted but subsequently got revised to remove uh, these offensive, offensive provisions. Uh, but the reason they used an existing law was they wanted to buy, basically buy time. Uh, now, not all countries have anticipated and started wiring internally. Uh, when I was in Tanzania, the president gave an estimate of something like 40,000 uh, basically miles of wiring that needs to be done uh, within the country. And that hasn't been done yet. They are still working on it. Uh, the, latest, the latest I heard, which is about a week ago, was that the fiber optic cable that lands in Dar es Salaam, which is very close to the city, the largest provider, internet provider, which is Twigger.com, is now using wireless to connect to the fiber optic cable, just because that infrastructure is not in place, uh, in place at all. But uh, the Seacom cable has already made it to Rwanda as, as of last week, I believe, through Uganda. So there's a lot that's going on, essentially to address with this question of uh, allowing for greater inclusion. I, I don't think that the monopolies are going to hold out for very long because there's enormous pressure coming from government and the youth, particularly, to, to actually get connected. Yes. Uh, just to follow on this theme of the you know digital divide and inclusion and so on, I'd be interested in you know your thinking about more of the two-step uh, approach where you know there is so much focus on getting the end user, the public individual uh, connected and in places like Africa and other developing countries this is a very very daunting task as you well know so um, it seems to me that more concentration on the people who serve the public uh, as a first step and you're talking about these uh, government um, sites being connected uh, you know having clinics and so on, focusing on those locations, getting the infrastructure, uh, you know, for rural health and so on, it's not so important that uh, each individual be connected, but rather the nurses and the clinics, and uh, obviously, and they can get tremendous amounts of help by being connected to, you know, disease information, and the headquarters in their agency, the, you know, the, the Ministry of Health and so on, you know, education. Yeah, I, this is my view, actually, is that uh, connecting to schools and health centers would be more important than connecting to other government departments or other connecting to post offices. 
I mean, so they're all important, but I'm saying as opposed to focusing on the individual, like every single person has to have a device and a connection as the first, you know, like overwhelming <coughs> task, you know, but rather give some priority uh, to these organizations that serve their needs, uh, but particularly when you're dealing with uh, low literacy and uh, so on. Yeah, the reason I'm, I'm interested in the devices is because, one, they are no longer $2,000 pieces of equipment. Those models of centralizing in one place, like a clinic or a, call, a center, IT center, was because the access devices were very expensive. But when you start to get to uh, $200 devices or less, $95 devices, Nokia has launched its netbook uh, book, booklet, uh, laptop, I don't know how much it costs. <coughs> but uh, my vision is that, uh, that the need to centralize may not be as critical as it was 10, 15 years ago, when the access devices were, computers were very expensive. Uh, and I would like to see actually these devices being, the prices being brought down essentially. And I think, I think that's the, the trajectory that uh, we are headed to. It's basically lab, cell phones are going to become more sophisticated. And there's already a cell phone culture. I think to get people off, Africans now offer cell phone culture and confine them uh, uh, to a kind of a, a, de a desk somewhere is going to be a lot more difficult. Right, I'm not thinking of that. I'm thinking of people who have no access, no cell phone, you know, not the people who are already using the technology and are connected, but you know, to reach those far distant. You know, yeah, I would deal with that under the principle of the, the extra mile, essentially, that infrastructure is going to, these services will start off with where there is infrastructure in the first place and then it will extend from there. And I'm not, I have no expectation that there, there will be universal coverage anytime soon. This has never happened, hasn't happened in the United States. We're still depend, debating in the U.S. about high-speed internet access. It's going to take time. I think the key thing is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is how to take advantage of emerging technology so that these countries don't end up adopting technologies that are being abandoned by the rest of the world. And many of these emerging technologies are cheaper and more, more efficient, and they build, on a, they build on existing infrastructure. So I could see, for example, telecom companies in Africa playing a much bigger role uh, in providing educational services than we've actually done in the past. Yes. Um. I wish I shared your optimism about the, the fate of the monopolies in Africa. Um, one of the things I worry about um, is that uh, um, uh, the kinds of research I've been reading about the submarine cable infrastructure you talked about um, seems, to, seems to suggest that we're going to have a repeat of the earlier uh, adoption problems with the first expensive cables. Um, I recall there was a big uh, proposal for mandating open access to submarine cables um, because of the large public involvement in funding some of them. Do you know uh, where the status of that is or if that? This is like the World Bank led. Yeah, yeah. There was a, a proposal I know that to mandate because of the public funds committed to mandate, particularly in East Africa, that the cables have an open access requirement because even if you get easy uh, and the other one, that's only two, right, to most of those sites, but now you only have one. Teams is going to operate on, a, on an open access policy. This is the one from, uh, did I just, did I just, yeah, yeah, Teams, which is uh, from uh, Fujaira in the United Arab Emirates to Mombasa, the, the Kenyan policy is to do it on the basis of open access. So, so I don't think it's going to happen overnight, uh, but I, I think it's going to be extremely difficult to have, to have this, the system maintain monopoly control when you have such massive redundancy in availability of, uh, of bandwidth. Uh, when, especially when Google kicks in in a year's time, this is going to, it's going to make it very difficult for existing operators to, to maintain a monopoly. The, what, most areas where we see this monopoly is where you have government involvement. So a large part of it is also going to be driven by liberalization of the markets. Um, so so I, I think it's going to be different from SAT-3. SAT-3, I think, was an aberration 
what isn't the standard for how the continent is going to function. Certainly cell phones, if you look at what's happened with cell phones, I think that's the standard of how these systems are going to function, not SAT-3. SAT-3 was a departure from the way cell phones were actually being designed. Yes? Um, I share your sense that the mobile <laughs> phone is likely to be the platform of choice for the continent. Certainly we've all watched this transformation over the last 10 years, and it really has been a very fundamental one. There are some downsides uh, to having mobile phones be your chief access device. Let me just toss out two of them really quickly. One is that, as our friend Jonathan Zittrain likes to say, this device plus the internet is very generative. It's very easy to create a brand new application, put it out there, people like it, they use it. On mobile phone networks, building something like M-Pesa, this amazing money transfer system, really requires the phone company to buy into it to some large degree. So this suggests possibly a different pathway. The second thing, we know that these companies in many cases have very close relationships with the government. This leads to some really interesting questions about surveillance, civil liberties, things along those lines. We saw uh, people sending text messages promoting ethnic violence in the wake of elections in Kenya. Then we saw the government do something very interesting, which was essentially requisition those records, identify 1,100 people who had sent those messages. And that sends a really interesting and perhaps chilling message to people who want to use these devices, say, to report on corruption. So how do, we, how do we work around those constraints? How do we make sure that this ends up being generative? And how do we make sure that this ends up being safe for a wide variety of uses? I think the answer to that is diversity in our approaches. And anybody who thinks they know how the continent is going to look like, including me, are crazy, totally crazy. Uh, because it's really difficult to anticipate uh, what is likely to happen when you have this level of infrastructure being made available. The other thing that I think is important is that this is coming, unlike SAT-3, this is happening after a phase of, of uh, democratic movements on the continent. So you have a lot of groups, constituencies, I know quite a number of organizations that want to take advantage of this infrastructure to make a, a lot of information being made publicly available, make it connecting it with a Google map, for example, to track movement of services, goods, uh, that basically enhancing transparency uh, on, the, on the continent. I think we're going to see those kinds of uses that will basically limit how much the government can do and get away with. It's not going to prevent the government from wanting to control it. They will just find other clever ways, clever ways of doing it. Uh, but I, I do agree. I have been told by co colleagues of mine in the Nigerian government who say that when uh, the telecom system was liberalized, they lost the capacity to track down criminals because they couldn't, could hardly now take a, listen to them on the, on the landline. Uh, and were very interesting kind of downside of, of the liberalization. This is why I think doing it uh, through a, a very clear public policy, which kind of opens up space, but allows for this proper management of the system to take place. In the case of Nigeria, they, they didn't do that. So the resistance to liberalization was coming from the police force. <laughs> because I'm sure that's the only problem with tracking down criminals in Nigeria. <laughs> My intent was not to beat up on I, Nigeria. I, that, but <laughs> it was hanging out there. I had to, had to take a swing at it. Yes. Um, had the opportunity of, uh, of working with a group of women's organizations in Uganda, um, trying to empower women in, in the northern part of rural Uganda. And there they were very creative in combining old media, community radio, and mobile phones that were applied to the women in groups with very scarce internet access and really had some impressive results there with rural, illiterate women. So I was just wondering whether you have some reflections on old media combined with so-called new media rather than this um, sense of everything going towards convergence? Yeah, my first example was uh, basically new media combining with old media. Winston the Pigeon is old media. <laughs> and uh, so radio is going to come back on a big scale uh, because of the, this convergence with podcasting. So we're going to see, I think, an expansion of the use of, of radio. And I, I believe that human beings were intended to be audio in the first place, not visual. 
and my proof is very simple. You can shut your eyes, but you can't shut your ears. So, 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 so a lot of education is going to go mobile because of the audio part. Um, and so I, I, I see a lot, of, and this especially for oral cultures that are historically oral, like African cultures. Uh, combining with old media, particularly radio, is going to be a very powerful, very powerful tool. I think I just heard on radio this morning a proposal that uh, professors should basically put, make their lectures available on iPhones uh, and iPods, and then the students listen to them before they come uh, to the classroom. So don't send your students your PowerPoint presentations, because that's totally useless. Send them your podcast. And then when they show up in class, they can start discussing right away. There's actually an example of this in Ghana, the University of Education in Winneba, uh, which is the only university I know of in Africa that has a large part of its curriculum uh, or education delivered by radio. And so when the students go in, they get a, a radio receiver. And it's also the only university that I know of where students can take their classes in bed. Because the morning classes, you don't have to wake up. They just take their devices and, and, uh, and listen to the lectures. So, so I think your point is a very powerful one. It's, it's really tapping into existing technology and upgrading them. That's, so, that's really what's, going to, what's likely to happen. Yes? mobile phones and laptops. Are you also saying that the $100 laptop may be redundant now? Uh, not redundant in a, in the, it has actually all these capabilities. The reason it doesn't use it is because of uh, various laws in various countries. It has video camera, it has voice, the teachers can communicate audio to students. Uh, actually, some, some, some do that. So it has all these capabilities. The limiting factor has been the legal obstacles to being seen as moving into uh, the telecoms, telecoms arena. So the, the one, that, that laptop is already, in fact, is already convergent. Uh, I'm sure there must be engineers here who uh, have figured it out. A lot of time went into figuring out how you cannot use it as a, as a phone. And the guy who was helping us to do exactly that was seen somewhere in Asia using it as a phone. <laughs> it's the same guy we hired to help us, prevent us from being, uh, getting in trouble with the telecoms company, companies. There, there's, there, it's technically you can use it as a phone. You can communicate anytime. Uh, and talk to the teacher. The whole, that's the whole idea. So the teacher can, can uh, it's a networking tool. So a teacher can type, work on it on one, uh, one screen, and because of the mesh network, everybody else gets connected. It has the same functionality for, uh, for audio as well. But because of restrictions for it not becoming a competitor to the telephone companies, arrangements have been made where it's not live. The teacher can send a, a message, it gets saved on the device, and the students can download it. But technically, it can be made to, to be live, in which case, it's basically a cheap, uh, zero cost, uh, basically, cell phone. Bilateral legal agreements, or is one legal agreement that is applicable to all the one that's a per child? This is just no this is telecoms regulation in any the, given country. Yeah, it's going to have restriction on who can offer phone service and whether there's licensing associated with that, and who gets a license for to operate in what area. So this is basically just getting into telecoms. That's the issue. Yeah, Nancy. Yeah. The, the chap wearing the proto Bluetooth rubber band. Yeah. That was Ethiopia. That's Ethiopia. Okay, thank you, thank you. I've, but, but, uh, I got in trouble with the with the people from the Gambia. Yeah. <laughs> for saying he was from Ethiopia. Uh, uh, a question about how you managed to establish the Victoria Institute of Science and Technology. First of all, I take it that it's a private institute and not public or not government um, sponsored. 
but was it by the use of the word institute as opposed to university or college? Is that how you got past the Ministry of Higher Ed? I, I actually haven't passed the Ministry of, <laughs> of Higher Ed. Uh, <laughs> we set it up as a, as a charitable trust. And as a charitable trust, you get registered under the Ministry of Lands. I have my lawyer here, Mahat. Uh, who knows all about this. So we, we had some good legal advice, uh -huh. uh, which was that you do it through the Ministry of Lands. Uh -huh. uh, and that's how we initi initially set it up. And then we said, now we want to offer some entrepreneurial training. Uh -huh. And as soon as you mention the word training, then you have to deal with either aid of the ministries. Uh, but we are partnering with an existing university. Uh, initially, it was going to be in my house because I didn't want anybody interfering uh, with it. And I told everybody that the chancellor of this institute was going to be my mother. <laughs> <laughs> this had a, a huge impact on a lot of people. Uh -huh. Nobody wanted to venture there. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. And then I got, uh, uh, it was funded entirely by friends of mine, actually, uh, just ask, asked friends of mine to make some contributions. We raised. $22,000, bought some equipment, uh, uh, which hasn't made it there yet. Mm. And uh, then we got this offer from an existing university to partner with them. And, and so by being a partner with an existing university, uh, we don't have to call ourselves an institution of higher learning because we are basically allied with the, uh, with the university. So if there are any, any aspects of our operations that have to do with the Minister of Higher Education, our partner university will, uh, uh, will take care of that. But that just illustrates all the hoops that one has to go through to <laughs> do anything that uh, supports innovation. Growth. Yeah, yeah there they are, uh, they are serious uh, barriers. And the, on, one, the only way to deal with those barriers, in my view, is to offer a, a demonstration that, that uh, dramatizes the futility of existing laws, like me going around telling everybody that I'm building an institution to train people in a multimedia technology, but I'm having it in my house because if I didn't do it under the protection of my own house, some bureaucrat somewhere is going to try to stop it. Then people start to say, wait a minute, we shouldn't be doing something like this. Similarly, you've seen our colleagues from South Africa doing it in an extremely dramatic way of just saying, let's show that today. The, the techniques used by Genghis Khan a long time ago can be applied today. Uh, otherwise, the system does not learn uh, unless you demonstrate clearly to them that uh, their policies are hindering. It's not sufficient to just analyze uh, and come up with the written evidence. It has to be concrete, it has to be in their face. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm curious, how does, how does this story sort of gel with other wider trends in the area? I mean, you've given examples from Kenya and Tanzania and even South Africa, but I mean, in terms of East African integration, economic integration, some of these things, has this been, um, has this been a roadblock? Has this been, or has this been something that's facilitated um, East African economic integration? And how does it connect with, you know, linguistic um, factors? I mean, I know that part of the East African community mechanisms stipulated Swahili as a lingua franca across the whole region. So what, what's, how are all these things working in effect, uh, either together and in what areas might they be sort of bumping up against and at odds with one another? We don't know. This, thing, this was launched in July, July 23rd. So okay. it's only three months old. So we really have no clue. Uh, but there are hints of what might happen. The Tanzanian president was very clear when he was launching it that he sees this as a tool for regional integration. Because one of the problems with regional integration has been agreeing on common standards, um, of which language is just a standard. And this tool offers or is inherently a common standard. Uh, secondly, facilitating the flow of services and ideas across the various countries. The fact that the CECOM cable has already reached Rwanda, mm -hmm. uh, that's theoretically, you can now start to have greater communication between Kenya, Uganda, 
and, uh, and Rwanda. So I think it's going to have an impact on uh, helping to integrate, uh, integrate the continent, by, by getting people to agree on common standards. There's already a lot of discussion among the ministers of telecoms in the region on harmonizing their policies and practices because they, they are now confined to using the same infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not like a railway where you can stop it at the border and change the gauge so that when the train gets there, you have to lift it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you, need to, you have to be paid to lift it. Mm -hmm. this, is, this makes it a lot more difficult to do that at every border. Anyone back there? Well, Rob? I just to there you go. Ask Cluster's thoughts on O3B. I've got a, a optimistic view of it and a pessimistic view of it, and I wonder which one is right. Um, the optimistic view is that here's an outside entity that's going to be offering affordable bandwidth to anybody who wants it, who can contract with them. It's going to circumvent the bureaucrats and it's going to break the monopolies there. That's the pessimistic view is that this is a very large company with 900 million in venture money behind them. They're going to bleed every last penny, penny they can out of everybody and the regulators are not going to stop regulating and they'll restrict access to this where it sees where, where it's in their interests. Do you have any thoughts on this or where it's going to go? Yeah, my view is that uh, the O3B networks, it's too bad I couldn't show the fantastic graphics that the best cartoons Around I have. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that this is not the last we've had of uh, mid-orbit satellites. It is just the beginning. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see other companies launch similar uh, satellites. I know the Japanese are thinking about it. Uh, so, so what's happening on land with the redundancy? I think we're going to see the same thing in, a, in satellite technology as well, because the technologies are getting more efficient, uh, cheaper to, uh, to launch, cheaper to manage. Uh, the question is whether you'll have companies of the, of the reach of Google. Uh, people are a little uneasy about Google. I'm actually going to have a word with them on some some issues that I'm interested in uh, in, in, in October. But uh, I would not be surprised to see, say, in the next five to ten years, a Chinese network of a similar kind that is targeting the developing world. That wouldn't surprise me at all. It didn't surprise me that the, the, the head of Google China has just stepped down to create his own company. Uh, people in China don't step down to create their own companies of that scale uh, if they don't have some close connection with the government. So, so, and China has always made it clear that it has always wanted to set its own standards, especially in telecommunication. So, so, so I can offer you a prediction that we are going to see competition with the o O3B. So, with that prediction, I think uh, I have to ask you all to join me in thanking Clusters for Can I ask you, please, do me a favor, could you have another clap for, for Winston the Pigeon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> join his Facebook group. Yeah.